everybody. Welcome back to another UNC basketball podcast here on TarHillIllustrated.com. I'm THI publisher Andrew Jones, and joining me is our director of basketball recruiting and analyst, longtime college AAU and high school coach, Mr. David Sisk. David, it's been a while since we've done one of these. Basketball season is here. You're coaching your team. I've got the double the the double whammy going on the overlap of basketball and football so it's twice the work but it is a lot of fun and i'll tell you there's a lot of excitement in my universe the media universe about north carolina basketball and i assume so with the fans too because there's so much newness there's so many question marks about this team from a personnel standpoint how certain guys will be, how they'll mesh together. And in year three of Hubert Davis, how is Hubert going to coach this team? I think we'll learn a lot more about him as a head coach based on how he handles this team. So I'm going to throw it right at you. What are maybe two things that jump out at you about this team that intrigues you the most? And just so people will know, we're going to get into all different kinds of aspects. Just hang around, saddle up for a while. We're going to have a fairly lengthy discussion here. And also a quick reminder, this show is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy, and we will have a word from them coming up a little bit later. But David, two things that just jump out big time that you find really intriguing about this team. Well, the first one, and we've discussed this before, but like you said, it's been a while. So it's it's been maybe i don't know the summer since yeah, we really so. kind of brought this up but you know one thing that i said was um how the roster hubert davis saw last year how woeful the shooting was and said we've got to go out and get some shooters so that's kind of the first thing that comes to mind is you know not only do you replace players so certain players leave new players come in and, and no program in the country was more influence in the transfer portal in North Carolina, but it's kind of how they, they went about it. Uh, they went and replaced a lot of non-shooters with shooters. So yeah. it's going to be not only different players, but different style of players. And, you know, I think that's going to be the first thing. And, you know, there's, and I guess the, the next thing, you know, there's been so much talk about Elliot Cadeau coming in, you know, how he's going to, change the team but i look at kind of guys you know maybe like a, a harrison ingram what kind of impact he has uh you know uh and there's been so many transfers but i i guess more be more so than that's the style of play so the shooters and the style of play would be the other thing because you know at times last year and there were a lot of times they just played so slow and we've talked about games where you know you were there and you could hear hubert davis you know, call them out of fast breaks to set up a play. And I think this year there's the emphasis, okay, we, we want to shoot the ball, but we want to play much faster too. And and I just keep hearing from recruits that I talk to that have seen them play, that have watched practice, that, you know, there's such a – just so much focus this year on, on getting up and down and really play, a, 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 you know, with a, a up-tempo and a, a very fast uh, pay, fast-paced style. Yeah, I did a drop a couple of weeks ago. I, I was at practice earlier in the month. We had player interviews, got to talk to them. We interviewed all 11 scholarship players. And I got a chance to watch practice for a while. And I did a drop afterward called Rip and Run. And and they, do, they did a Rip and Run drill last year. They do it every year. Everybody does a Rip and Run drill of some kind. But this was different because it, they have the parts to fill lanes, and you can't run. People think, well, you got a point guard that can run, so you should be on a fast break. You've got to have the parts to fill the lanes that can get down the floor and trail in order to run the fast break the right way. And it's not just fast break. It's just push the ball up quickly, get set, and 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 go into a half court, whatever it is, whether it's a motion, whether it's a freelance or a set, before the defense can set. And you can get a lot of quick looks that way. And I think that's what we're going to see from this team more, David. They may not fast break a whole lot more, but I think they're going to take shots, good shots, earlier in shot clocks this year than a year ago. There were a lot of times last year they had to reset a possession. RJ would back it up or Kayla would back it up, and you knew it was coming. And it was not high percentage stuff. I don't think there's going to be as much of that this year. The shots are going to be there. 
Uh, they're going to have a lot of ISO stuff for Armando because the shots are going to be there around him. It's it's going to be a lot harder to leave guys to double him. I just expect more offensive efficiency in the half court, and I expect quicker half court. Last year, I described it as him playing in sand a lot. I don't think they're going to play in sand this year. They're not going to be overly dynamic with athletic ability. But I just think the way they're going to play off one another is going to allow for some quick basketball. Yeah, and, you know, it, you said one thing you said was uh, being able to get Armando shots. Uh, and that's the big thing last year. They couldn't stretch the floor at all. So they could they had guys that didn't have to guard on the perimeter, and they just stay on the paint to help on him, and they can't get the ball inside. And I do think at times that they did make the effort to try to do that. And I don't think they did earlier in the year. Early in the year when you watched them, and remember they beat Alabama, uh, you know, in a very high-scoring game, that was a hard one to watch. There were so many overtimes. Both yeah. teams just caught up in so much one-on-one and isolation play. And it's dribble, dribble, dribble. And it's bad shots. And there's no ball movement, even when they were scoring points. So, yeah. uh, I think this year – you kind of look at it, sets up better for Armando because he's got shooters around them. They're not going to be the hip off so much. So the doubles are going to be coming later after he gets the ball rather than four. Uh, so he'll be able to get the ball, and then we'll see what he does with it from there. But you have a pretty good idea. Anytime Armando Baycott's got the ball in his hands on a low post, that's a good thing for North Carolina. But I think the other thing is that uh, the ball movement, you know, it, it's just – you're going to, it's going to be easier for a fan to watch because you're going to have ball movement, player movement. It's going to be shared. It's going to be less isolation. It's going to be less, yeah. I, you know, I wouldn't even call it one-on-one. I call it one-on-three, one-on-four at times. There's going to be a lot less of that. And, and so, therefore, you're taking better shots and you're getting more shots in rhythm. But you mentioned the Alabama game. I think the Alabama game haunted this team all year long, and I thought that fans constantly referenced that game as sort of what was an early sign of what was wrong because they had chances to win that game, regulation, and a couple of the overtimes, and they were not able to do it because they played one on three. Caleb scored 30-some-odd points, but he shot like 28% or something from the floor that night. I don't think you're going to see games like that. You're not going to see guys go three for 17 on this team this year. They're just not going to shoot that much. One of the things I love about the Harrison Ingram addition is that even on a team that struggled offensively at times last year and a club that lost a lot of close games, he only he averaged fewer than 10 shots a game. He didn't think that he had to just take over the game and will a team to victory, whether he was capable or not. He still played within the framework of the team. So he's if you slide him in and say he's getting shots and Caleb's not – you're not going to see him go three for 13 because he's or three for 17. He's not going to take 17 shots unless he gets 17 great shots. So I do think that they are going to be more efficient simply with that. They're going to be a lot more three on three, five on five than the one on three stuff. The one on three stuff is probably a thing of the past, at least with this team. I just I'm, don't see the makeup of these guys buying into that kind of approach. I think that they want to be more connected because this is a goal is greater than the sum of its parts kind of deal uh, and let me say this i you know since we made the north carolina alabama comparison last year i saw alabama play uh live three times last year i saw them um i went and watched kentucky play them in tuscaloosa and i watched them in the sec tournament i watched them play missouri and I watched them play uh, – gosh, I can't even remember the other team up there. But I saw them twice in Nashville in March. And, you know, you you watch them in games and, and even on TV in your life. Is this the same team North Carolina played early in the year? Because, man, there was times that offense just looked unguardable. And, yeah. uh, it, it, and it wasn't all that stuff they had you know, when they were playing North Carolina early in the year where North Carolina really didn't improve. So yeah. my question, I wonder this year, I think we do think the offense is going to click for North Carolina, but there is a question, when does it happen? Because Alabama's didn't early. So a lot of new players, a lot of guys still trying to learn each other, you know, and it gets a lot different when you're playing really good teams and you've got yeah. different guys. So does it click early? 
If not, can you be patient and get through it? And then does it grow? I, I think it's going to get better as the year goes. I think that's going to be a big difference. Is this, they're going to get better. So early on, how good will it be? And and then when when does it really start clicking? It may, who knows? It may click game one and just hit right off the bat. But, you know, when does it really start taking place? And I think fans need to have patience a little bit because I do think it will come together. I agree. They have smart guys. They have older guys. They have guys that have achieved. And and they have something that I think is really, really interesting. And we're seeing it during this period because of the the uniqueness of college athletics right now, where some guys are playing a sixth year, uh, is that the fact that they have five guys on the roster that were captains last year. And they're going to start four of them. Baycott Davis, Cormac Ryan, and Paxson Wojcik. The other guy who was a captain was... Jalen Withers and Harrison Ingram told me he would have been a captain. He was basically a, a, a pseudo captain because Jared Haas, who's a Roy Williams disciple has a rule in his program that seniors are captains, but Harrison was the fanny smacker in the timeouts. Harrison was a guy who had the ball at the top in clock situations and would gather the team at the, at the free throw line before a free throw shot and call the defense and that kind of thing. So in a sense, they have six captains, five who were named captains and six guys who had the role of captain last year. How do you think that that will help them get through what could be some early growing pains as they figure this thing out? I think it helps because I think when you have that, you have guys that are about the team, about making other players better, putting others before themselves. But I think you've also got communicators. And that's big. You know, I, we've got a story up right now with Drake Powell. And I talked to him. This is as we do this. It's a Wednesday night. I interviewed him last night and uh, talked about, hey, what are you really working on? I, you know, and I, I thought it might be, you know, will it be outside shootings? It's going to be those kind of things. And he said, it's communication. He said, my mm-hmm. coach has really spoke, uh, talked to me about the need for communication. And he's, he said, I've got these clips from guys like Tim Tebow, and, uh, you know, and, and others. And, um, you know, and one thing he said was going to you know, North Carolina and watching practice and watching all that. He sees how important it is. So yeah. that tells me, yes, it is important. The coaches think it's important. But more than, than anything, how it translates right now, I think he goes to practice and he sees North Carolina players, like you say, that are accustomed to that role and know, know they know how to communicate effectively. And that's what they're doing. I think that kind of sticks out to him and others when they come and watch them as, hey, these guys are communicating. And I'll say this, you talk about individuals, you talk about all the captains, I'm going to tell you, uh, 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 two of the better communicators you'll ever come across are Seth Trimble and Joe Washington. So even guys who are not, I mean, Seth Trimble's as personal as it gets. So, and I've noticed that's the kind of, Josh Hubert Davis is kind of brought in. I mean, you look at right now, James Brown, great interview, great, uh, great communicator, you know, personable, personality, outgoing, great pal, personality, outgoing, good, great interview. Ian Jackson, you know, he's just, he, he just talks to everybody. So these are, the, they're not bringing in mutes and quiet guys. You know, they're talking to guys who can articulate, communicate and express themselves. And I, I think you then they learn how to do that on the floor. Well, that's interesting you say that because I want to go through a series of things that I've learned over the last month or so being around the team and and, and get your take on them. But I, I'm going to hit that right now since you just brought it up. Uh, they have a lot of long-term view guys in the program and, and people aren't really talking a whole lot about Jalen Washington and Seth Trimble. They're not really sure what to say. They don't know what the roles are going to be. Everything I know about the two of them, and Jalen Washington has clearly proven that through his years of rehab in the summer, and he finally had a full summer of actual basketball this this past offseason. But these are two guys that have long-term views. Like They, they weren't impatient and jumped like some of the other guys did. And I think that that's going to help this team because older guys are going to play. And then you got a young one like Elliott there who's going to get on the court and play. Seth may not get – 
any more time than he got a year ago when he becomes healthy and he's a little banged up right now. And I, and I don't see those guys being a problem if they're not getting the minutes that they would like to have because they have a long-term view. And I think that's going to be important factor and important component with this team because there's only four returning scholarship guys and there are two of them and there are two that may not play as much as people expect this year certainly Jalen but that doesn't mean next year he won't be a starter yeah. and be a 15 and 10 guy and I think both Jalen and Seth understand that I think that there's patience there and they understand the long-term view and that's going to be part of the component of all these mature guys, these communicating guys, these thinking guys that they're going to have. So when they do go through some tough spots, I think they're going to be able to get through it better than last year's group did because I just think it's a group that is wired to handle some of that stuff better than last year's group was. Yeah, and it'll be interesting, you know, how how deep Hubert wants to go. And because, I mean, you can look at this lineup and say, well, man, there's a lot of guys you can play here. But if you'll remember, the first year, they called it the Iron Five. Now, I know that you've gone out and said that they have, that he didn't really intend it to be that way. But that's the way it turned out because those were the guys that stood out. And I think last year, there was a criticism that Hubert Davis didn't go to some of these guys enough. Maybe you're Tyler Nichols and guys like that. That's why he left because he didn't play them. But I think you tried to give him a chance. Now, it's just my opinion. People would disagree. I think you tried to give him a chance. And he knew every game was important. Man, one one or two games with the difference last year, maybe making the NCAA tournament not. But he had to go with his best. And I think he gave some of these other guys opportunities, and, and they just couldn't do it. And so that's going to be the question this year. Exactly. Um, you know, how many of these guys will he play? You know, how much does Baycott come out? How much does RJ come out? You know, how much does Harrison Ingram come out? And so are there guys, like you say, we're expecting to be parts of this that maybe aren't as much as what we think? That's going to be interesting because, you know, a lot of coaches, they don't want to play more than seven or eight. And uh, just because you got to get your guy reps and you got to, you need your best guys need to be happy in the locker room. So that makes a big difference. So, that's going to be, uh, like I said, a big part of this. But I agree 100%. Jalen Washington, if I'm Jalen, we're already thinking ahead. What is this <laughs> North Carolina inside game going to look like in 24-25? Yeah. Well, Jalen Washington needs to realize that. What yeah. if you? What if Elliot Cadeau is one and done? We don't know that. I'm just throwing it out there. What if he's one and done? You know, and RJ – Besides, hey, I'm not going, you know, he could come back for your number five if he wanted to, but I'm not going to yeah. do that. So there you are again. So it's, you know, Seth Trimble's show. So, yeah. you know, those are things to look at. So they got to look at the future, you know, and if they don't get the time they want, would I rather, why go somewhere else? Well, I'm getting out of here. Why go somewhere else and play that's n- not nearly the program of a North Carolina when you could stay and, <laughs> be a huge huge part a year later and then who knows they may play a bunch like you say yeah. we're just scenarios out there but uh like you say I, it, hopefully they see the importance of being part of a long-term program the way it used to be where it was all about four-year development i, I want to hit on the bench a little bit later and get your take on a few things i'm going to go through some stuff that guys uh told me over the last month or so talking to him. And I will say that Armando said last week that he's not going to play as much because he said he wore down the last two years. He's not going to play as much. He wants to come out and he needs to have more of a break. So that's the Oconquo uh, uh, part there. That's maybe Zayden High being better than people thought coming in. We don't know yet. That that could be Jalen Withers with his length able to slide. He's a pretty big dude. He looks like he's closer to six ten than than six eight, sliding down and helping out. But I think that that's going to be intriguing to see how Hubert saves in minutes with Armando, especially early in the year. So here I'm going to hit on some stuff that I found very very interesting, and I think in some cases bodes well. You're a, you're a, you're a coach. You've been coaching for a long time. You understand shooting. You understand the, the mental aspect of shooting. You also understand yeah. the difference between shooting off the dribble and shooting in a catch and shoot situation. Yeah. I asked Cormac Ryan, what is the one thing people, Carolina fans who know his game, they've seen it for years, will see different in him now 
than they did at Notre Dame. The, immediately he said catch and shoot. He said most of his shots from the perimeter at Notre Dame were off the dribble. And now it's going to be catch and shoot because of their spread, because of the vision, because there's a bunch of guys with awareness out there. I asked Harrison Ingram, Carolina fans didn't know his game as well because nobody stays up and watches Stanford. But for those who did, I said, tell them what you, how your games could be different. What's the first thing someone's going to notice that's different about your game? He said, catch and shoot. And he said, most all of his shots were off the dribble. He said, I didn't shoot a high percentage last year. Most of my shots were off the dribble. I'm doing nothing but catch and shoot now. And I'm a much better shooter, catch and shoot. As as a sidebar to that, he also added that in that period in the summer for three weeks when they're home, he worked out with Seth Curry's individual coach, his strength coach, his, his trainer, and worked on a shot with Seth Curry, catch and shoot, catch and shoot, catch and shoot. How much of a difference, especially for an older guy like those two, will catch and shoot make, do you think, as opposed to shooting off the dribble? It's huge, and I'll start with Harrison Ingram because, you know, when when I, he was one of the first guys when I went to work for you, when I first started, he was one of the first guys that I covered in recruitment. He was a top fifteen player. So when yeah. you look at five stars, and you look at Drake Powell, and you look at Ian Jackson, and you look at Elliot Cadeau, Harrison Ingram's a five star himself. Harrison Ingram, outside of Cadeau, and I'm trying to think. I'm sure this is right because I'm pulling this off the top of my head. He's a high-strength high school player. Higher, I'd have to look at Baycott. But those three are the highest three ranked high school players on this roster. I mean, he was a five-star. He was a McDonald's yeah. All-American. So, and so I covered him there at the very end. Roy was still a head coach. Roy was recruiting him hard. And, and, and North Carolina, it made sense he came here because North Carolina was in the thick of it to the end. So um, I knew what kind of player he was, but I was surprised. You know, when I started looking at these numbers from Stanford, his outside shooting numbers were not good at all. Yeah. And I spoke to several individuals that had access to him, um, you know, knew him well as Stanford. I talked to Pac-12 guys. Pac-12 coaches, and they were like, look, he is an outstanding player. He can really play. He is an outstanding player. So I think maybe getting to North Carolina with more talent around him and things like that, I think he needed something new. But anyway, I look at him, and I'm like, you know, we you've had the perimeter players the last couple of years that couldn't make a jump shot. The thing about Harrison Ingham, he's well-rounded, good size, exquisite passer and vision. The question is going to be, can he shoot the ball? If, if Harrison Ingram, to me, if you say, okay, what's the one thing that has to happen for this team to reach a ceiling? Harrison Ingram has to make outside shots. Yeah, I think if I Harrison agree. Ingram makes outside shots, then you're talking about a very, very legit North Carolina basketball team this year. If he doesn't, then all of a sudden you got a guy because – you need him out on the floor. So you don't need some of these other wings coming in taking his time, you know, because you want your best guys out there. And he is one of the better guys. But if he's not making shots, all of a sudden he becomes a guy you play off of. And that's yeah. not good for Baycott. So that's one thing. So that that is a must for North Carolina. So it's, it's really good. Uh, that, that's good news for everybody. And let me, let me jump in real fast. Go back, Go back to the – let me jump in. I want to ask you a quick question about that so I don't lose it. Does it matter where he hits the shots from or yeah. does he need to hit that corner jumper? Because if he's shooting corner jumpers and he's not making them, when guys play off, that just cuts off all those slashing lanes. Well, it's going to depend on the movement. So I think if you're talking about the offense moving as much as what we've been discussing, he's going to be all over the floor. So he's going to be up top. He's going to be on the wing. He's going to be on the corner. So – I don't think it's a deal where you stand for it. Well, you're in this spot. You're in this spot. Uh, yeah, but but where a lot of them end up, because a lot of Brady's ended up. Brady's ended up all over the place. Yeah. But, the, the, but when he had games where he was hitting that corner three, everything was open. I, it just I, made the core twice as big. I see Ingram maybe the floor a little bit more because he's such a good pass. And so Brady was a driving kick, dude, or a guy that the post could kick out to. You know, you had at that time, RJ was making shots, Caleb Lovell making shots, and they can both get to the rim. So they're into the paint, they're drawing, they're kicking, he's in the corner. And he's also playing a four 
He was very good at the trail on the secondary break and on the fast break. Defense gets back. They come down. They can just pitch it behind him. He's making shots from the top. And I think Harrison Ingram is such a good passer. I think that's a skill that he's not going to be – and probably his best skill. It's hard to use that from a corner. So, I think he's going to be – I think he'll be in the middle of the floor more than what you think. And okay. now, if he's on the wing, yeah, he needs to make that shot or that corner shot so they can't back off. But I also think – I think he's a guy just because he can pass the movement. But he, I think his passing allows him to get to the middle of the floor a little bit more. Okay, what was but, the point you were going to make after uh, a second ago when, Cormac, I, when I interrupted you? Cormac, yeah. So, we had had an idea Cormac was catching a catch and shoot three guy, right, at Notre Dame, okay? Uh, and you say, why would you think that? Because that's what Notre Dame is. And, you know, they shoot more – they probably will shoot more threes in a, a week and most teams shoot in a year. Uh, you know, it's what they've done the last few years. But when I watched him – so I did a film breakdown on him, you know, in the spring, right after he committed. If, if we had a piece, if you'll remember. Yeah, And the thing I got to noticing, I, I watched like four to five games full length, and I'm like, man, everything's on the floor. He's putting the ball on the floor. There's very few of these, you know. It's just totally different from what I expected. So, yeah, and that was – that. there was a lot of things, pulling up off the dribble, getting into the high post off the dribble, things like that. Now, not a guy that will break down the defense like LeBron James. He's a locomotive get to the rim. That's not the case. But dribbling into that high post spot, really dribbling into that mid range, a lot of that. So, uh, you know, analytics like three point shot better anyway. So, obviously, if you catch and shoot, you're you're probably gonna have better numbers. But you know, if you can dribble to your spot, and get that off. Paul Pierce got in the Hall of Fame for doing that. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Matt has some of that in his game, but yeah, I can see there being. Him saying, hey, I got more catch and shoot this year because of games that I saw. Like I said, I probably watched five, close to half a dozen games. They, you know, really just watching him, it wasn't there. I thought it would have, would have been in that offensive system, but it wasn't. And I think that's because he did not have guys that could create around him. You know, if you were going to score at Notre Dame, you had to create something because they had no guards who could break. You saw them live. They had yeah. no guards that could break you down and kick to an open shooter. Well, what's the difference this year? You've got R.J. Davis. You've got Elliot Cadeau. You've got guys who can yeah. put the defense and make them collapse and then kick to a shooter. I think that's a big difference in Notre Dame last year, North Carolina this year. I went back and looked at every one of his games because I do something on each one of these guys, the returning ones and the new ones, their five best games from last year and what they might mean. And I would, tr when he had high scoring games, I would track when he got his points. Like Harrison Ingram is a guy that get a bucket here, a couple minutes later, get an assist, then a little bit later, get a bucket. There was a consistency with his game that he was constantly involved, but he wasn't piling stuff on in bunches that much. Cormac would have games where when they played well, he would have stretches. He'd go six minutes and score 15 points. And then he wouldn't score for a while. And you'd see a lot of missed shots in there. And one of the things I remember about watching him in person last year, especially the game in South Bend, he took a lot of tough shots because somebody had to shoot. Leshevsky didn't have a very good year last year. Goodwin didn't have a very good year. And there was a lot of pressure on him to create his own shot, knowing that other guys weren't going to get open. They had a very ugly offense. Bray's offense the last few years was not like it was when he had Connaughton and all those dudes. And, and I think his shooting percentage, I was surprised it's 34.5% because I saw him take so many bad shots, tough shots, because someone had to shoot the ball in those situations. So when I look at him and I see him have those stretches where he was on fire and could carry a team for a stretch, not as your go-to guy, not as your number two guy, but if your third or fourth scorer is a guy that can pile points on his stretches, what does that do to the opponent, knowing that that guy's not the number one or two option, but he can go off at any time and take a game from a 15 to 15 to 32 to 22? Yeah, and that makes a big difference. I'm going to tell you what, that wears on uh, a player, too, when those situations constantly happen, and I'll give you an example. You can go back and think about um, 
I go back and think about when Kevin Durant played with Westbrook, Russell Westbrook, and how Durant wanted away from Westbrook so badly because if you could watch him and, and, and Westbrook would dribble around and it'd be two or three seconds left to go on the shot clock and he wouldn't have anything to throw the ball to Durant. You know, Durant made <laughs> is unbelievable how many times he got the ball with two seconds left on the shot clock simply because Westbrook didn't get a shot off. And it's like, okay, instead of me taking it, I'm throwing it to you. And, you know, that was a, a big deal at that time. It, it was well documented. So uh, I think it wears on you. I, I just think throughout a season, you know, you hear that like in football, there's nobody healthy. Everybody's hurt, you know, in football about this time of year. Well, I think basketball is so long and arduous throughout the season that it wear. there are things mentally that wear on you. And, and I think if I'm a basketball player that would, if, if I can't get, it's like playing golf and not being able to make a putt. You know, you can, you can hit a fairway every time, you can hit a great iron shot, and, man, you can be the best ball striker in the world, and you constantly have five-foot putts and you can't make one. And I think that's the same. And that makes you want to quit. So I I think basketball would be kind of, you know, it's kind of the same thing. It doesn't make you want to quit. It's very discouraging when it's just, you know, you can't get a clean look. And it's just, it's going to be hard to make shots. It's going to be hard to have good field goal percentage. It's going to be hard to do any of that simply because you can't get, you can't get a clean look. You can't get a good look. Everything's going to be just contested. I think it affects the rest of your game. So when you do get a good look, sometimes guys will rush it a little bit because, oh, I finally got something here. We're going to get into other, a bunch of the other Tar Heels. We're going to talk more about this. we got a lot going on here, previewing the 2023-24 Carolina basketball season. But before we continue, let's very quickly hear a message from our sponsor, Underdog Fantasy. Yes, guys, we are so, so excited to be partnered with Underdog Fantasy fantasy and we decided to partner with underdog because it's the easiest place to play fantasy sports and it's also the fastest growing fantasy app in the industry right now as well and underdog fantasy has so so much to offer including their pick'em game and in pick'em you pick whether your favorite players will have a higher or lower stat total in the sweets game for a chance to win big it's so easy to play just pick two to five stats of your favorite players and choose whether they'll go higher or lower you can 20 extra money by going just five for five they also have a best ball mania if you think you know football you need to check this one out this year's best ball mania has 15 million dollars in total prizes up for grabs with the winner taking home three million dollars so sign up today with the promo code heel h-e-e-l and get your first deposit doubled up to one hundred dollars Visit underdogfantasy.com or find them in the app store. And don't forget to register with that promo code HEAL to get your first deposit doubled up to $100. Must be 18 plus and present in the state where Underdog Fantasy operates. Terms do apply. And if you're concerned with your play, call 1-800-522-4700 or visit ncpgambling.org. Back to the show. All right. We appreciate Underdog Fantasy partnering with us all football season long so far. And they'll stay with us through the football season and hopefully – We'll have some time together during uh, basketball season as well. So, David, uh, I was talking to R.J. Davis last week in Charlotte. We, I, I was asking him some questions about Pax and Wojcik, and I made it a, a mission of You're mine. a name dropper. You remind me of Charles Barkley. You're a name dropper. Why? Well, I'm a name dropper. You know, all these, all these stars that you hang out with. Well, I mean, I had to do it for my job. That's all. It's not like I'm, hey, hey R.J. and I went out for a bite and – and all that. Although I did have a nice word with with Joel Berry, and Joel actually, since you brought it up, I'm going to go ahead and name drop that too. Joel said that he's hearing great things about Cormac Ryan. That's what he told me. So, and he says he thinks this has his team has a chance to be really, really good, a lot better than last year. He said. So anyway, no, enough of my name dropping. So in the in the in the nature of my job, I was talking to this guard named R.J. Davis from North Carolina last week. And I, my mission last week was to get a lot of stuff from RJ and Armando about Paxson. And it's because so many people are kind of bent out of shape that Paxson is in the starting lineup right now. And Elliot Cadeau is. And so I wanted to get what RJ and Armando would tell me, I think genuinely about Paxson. I think we've gotten to the point with both of them and how I have a working relationship with them, that they're going to be pretty upfront about some stuff. So the second thing I asked RJ 
I don't even remember what the first thing was, but we have it on the video on the channel. I, I said, Paxson had 13 rebounds in a game at Michigan State last year, and RJ's eyes bugged out. Like, what? He didn't know that. So, yeah, he had 13 rebounds in a game at Michigan State, and then he had a game a week later at Northwestern, had like nine. And RJ said, well, that, explain, that explains a lot. I, well, what do you mean? And he said he's getting rebounds all over the place in practice. Offensive end, defensive end, he's getting them from the wing, weak side offensive rebounds. And he's a gritty guy. And he said, you never would have thought it. I had no idea that that's the kind of player he was. Armando said the same thing. He said he's really surprised at the kind of player Paxson is. When he showed up, he didn't think he was that kind of guy. Didn't think he played with the edge. So I'm going to ask you about Paxson Wojcik. He's a guy that showed skill. He could shoot the ball pretty well. He's got nice assist numbers. He's a player that at Brown, as a captain, had a lot of games where he'd get a decent number of rebounds, maybe seven rebounds, five assists, 14 points, and his scoring really picked up late in the season last year. So what does that tell you about a guy like that? People say, yeah, I was in the Ivy League, but he goes into – East Lansing, his dad's an assistant at Michigan State, so they scouted his dad, and and his dad knows what kind of game his son has, and he still goes in there and grabs 13 rebounds. What does that tell you? We knew he was rugged. If you go back and look at numbers, we broke all that down before, you know, as soon as he – when we knew he was a candidate to transfer, we broke all those numbers down and those stats. Yeah. It was obvious – we were looking at a bigger wing who was rugged. You know, it, it, you look at some of these kids, and, and look, it's the elephant in the room, you, and I'm not going to say why, but you look at some of these kids and you're going, okay, I'm looking at him. I see what he looks like. He's a catch-and-shoot three-point shooter, you know, and yeah. we all do that. He was not. He is a rugged kind of kid, a rugged player. Like you said, high-volume rebounder from the wing spot physical body when you look at it older so i'm not surprised by any of course you playing at a smaller level you don't know how that transfers to the big time it doesn't get yeah. any bigger than university of north carolina but obviously the mental makeup and toughness is there now does it catch on physically you know on this type of level you know he's not not going to have any back down yet. so none of that's a surprise and if you go back to North Carolina, as long as I can remember, going back to Dean Smith, you know, they were always, every year, one of the top rebounding teams in the country. Whether it's it, it's it's uh, Dean Smith, Bill Guttridge, even Matt Doherty, you know, Roy Williams, to Hubert Davis, the, these are going to be, these are supposed to be North Carolina, it's what he it hangs its hat on. And so he fits that mode well. So what North Carolina does traditionally I think he'll bring some of that. I mean, you think about it. You've already got Baycock. So what if you have a wing and grab two or three offensive rebounds a game? Man, it's huge. I mean, that, can that, score that, off that of him. He's a put back, he's a quick top. quick back guy. He's a quick. Yeah, quick and that back probably guy. puts you that probably puts you over the top in national rebounding stats and numbers because they, they're going to be up there anyway. You add three more onto that, and man. Jalen Withers is another guy that can do that. He's not a super high volume rebounder, but he can. I think that I, I'm reserving a lot of judgment on him. Jacob and I just did a podcast about him the other day. And I, I said, you know, I don't know if we really know what kind of player he is because Louisville was an absolute colossal mess. And it ain't going to get I mean, any better this year. If you say what's happening to Prince. Yeah, I, I already saw that. Um, it, it didn't help him that he played with a point guard who never shot, met a shot he didn't like. Ellis, a nice player, but that yeah. was not the kind of dude you want to play for, play with. And I saw him play quite a bit in college. I always liked him. In fact, when I reminded Jacob, when we, uh, when we did our basketball show last year, the week that they went to Louisville, I think they went to Charlottesville and Louisville that week. And I mentioned Jalen Withers. We talked about Ellis, but I mentioned Withers because I always kind of liked that there's a lot of stuff in his game. Like he brings a bag to the game. A lot of it wasn't super refined, but he could shoot. That's always a nice part to have thing to have in your bag. He was real athletic and he was very good defensively. He's a very willing defender, a good help side defender, pretty good on the ball and played with real good energy. I'm thinking that at North Carolina now, 
in a completely different environment that he's like whatever there whatever elements of his game are really good they're going to have more of an opportunity to come out because he's not going to have to lean on some of the parts of his game that aren't real good because his team is so desperate to stay competitive in a game and i think the mental makeup approaching a game that you have a chance to win every night as opposed to last year when they knew most of the time they were had no chance of winning that night. Yeah. I think that there's going to be a lot more uh, of his game that we see, but let me ask you, do you, do you buy into that? And how much do you weigh on what you saw last year from him being on a team that went four and four and 28, four and 29? I weigh nothing. I put nothing into what he was did last year especially if, if you are not the ball-dominant guy. Now, if you're the ball-dominant guy and you're putting the ball on the floor and it's in your hands and you can't create anything and you're taking bad shots, then, yeah, I take something from it. But if you're kind of variable and you're dependent uh, on that individual, then, yeah, that's an issue. That's not as much of an issue because, you know, it, it's you have to have certain kind of guys helping you. So, you know, I think the whole take is this year, R.J. Davis can get him shots. Elliot Cadeau can get him shots. Playing around, Armando Baycott can get him shots. And so, you know, I, and that doesn't mean it's a slam dunk, but you have to – I'm not going to say give him the benefit of the doubt, but I think you've got to say, okay, it's a brand-new opportunity. So yeah. I, I think that's the way I would frame it. But I also believe – that, um, you know, he, he's done some good things early on, too. I've talked to so many recruits that have been in on visits. I cannot remember which one told me this. I've talked to every kid that's been in on campus this fall and done interviews with them. And I'm trying – I have to go back and look. But one of them asked what stuck out when you watched them practice, and he said how good Jalen Withers was. Yeah. So – and I'd have to go back and see which one it was, but – he uh, I, I, he has impressed some people that obviously know basketball. He brings an athletic ability that they haven't had a lot of in recent years. And the thing I really like about him, and I like this a lot about Cormac Ryan, and Cormac did this at at, at Notre Dame some too, is they both fill the lanes really well, and so does Ingram. And that's what I was saying earlier about them being a fast break team. They may not be a super fast team, but if you economize all of your movement, and you're really good at cutting. And if you could cut, you can catch and you go right up and score. That's huge. That, that You're going to be a step quicker than what people would think your natural athletic ability would command. And with Ryan and Ingram, they're both those kind of guys. And Withers is just a freak athlete. He's a win dunk, a dunk contest kind of guy. I also think he gives them a baseline element. I asked Harrison, I said, are you a baseline guy? Do you, you play the baseline? He kind of, way his facial expression told me, no, he's not much of a baseline guy. Not a lot of dudes are. It's kind of a lost thing in the game a little bit, but in, uh, but Withers has baseline game. If he's got a two dribble baseline game and he can square, he's going to finish. It's a really good finisher around the rim, but, but David, he's a good shooter. That's the one thing I take from that in his defense and his bounciness. That's what I take from Louisville. If you can hit shots in that offense, you can hit shots. And he hit some tough shots. He was pretty consistent at it. And and in, when they played well, when they won games or they were close against good teams, he always showed up. He was always in that 12, 14 points, you know, eight rebounds. And he stayed in the game, didn't get in a lot of foul trouble, and was able to give them a positive presence out there. I think that I'm not going to say that, that Coach Davis is looking for a four who is a – another Brady Manic, because there aren't many guys like that. But I think he wants a guy that can bring some of what Brady Manic did. And, you know, look, that was a problem last year. They couldn't get any straight. They couldn't get anything from the four spot outside. And if you look, and look, this has been a widely uh, discussed topic on nationally what the opinion on is on Hubert Davis. Is he the coach that went to the Final Four in year one? Is he the coach that didn't make the NCAA tournament last year? Is it somewhere in between? And you'll hear some of the naysayers say, look, in two years, they got hot late February and March of his first year. 
and that's yeah. been it. But one reason they got hot was because Brady Manick was out of his mind. Uh, you know, once they started picking it up in, in uh, 22, 23. So obviously, like we said, I give him credit because it's been a point where, you know, if you do the same, expect different results, that's a definition of insanity. And, and he definitely wanted to change from what he had last year. And I think try to find something like you had Manic. Withers is a different player than Manic, totally different player, but he can shoot the outside shot. So I think having a guy who can stretch at that four spot is a big issue for them. I think it really frees up the guards. I think it frees up Baycott. And, uh, but it also him being bouncy, like you say, that's a good thing because and that's yeah. a big helps defensively. It just helps the more athleticism, obviously the better. So, uh, you know, hopefully for North Carolina, you know, he's got a ceiling I think you can play to. So if he does that, it's going to be very good for the team. Well, they also have a couple of options at four. Last year, they kind of had Pete, and that was it. Yeah. Uh, Pete was the other big guy. That was pretty much it. Jalen wasn't ready for a long time. Now, I think that some of these parts can be a little bit interchangeable, and you can use certain guys against certain styles and and kind of move them around accordingly. So let's go to a couple. Um, we don't want to spend much time on Oconquo, really. Um, don't want to spend much time on Zayden High, even though I'm hearing really good things. I don't want to have a two hour podcast here. I'm going to ask you about the two main returning guys and just tell me straight up, what do you expect from RJ Davis? And then we'll hit Armando after that. I think it'd be a first team type all ACC. Uh, I'm an RJ Davis fan. Yeah. I have been unapologetic. Um, if you look what he did two years ago, and then you look at what he did last year, R.J. Davis, to me, was a the bright spot in a bad year. He brought it. If you look at numbers, if you look at shooting percentages, if you – well, okay, North Carolina couldn't shoot outside shot. Well, R.J. could. You know, he made shots. Uh, games where North Carolina didn't show up, R.J. showed up. And at times you kind of felt like, he was really just kind of carrying his team on his back. And uh, I, I just see more. I, to, to me, he's been everything you could ask for in the last two years. And I don't see why this coming year is going to be any different. Um, I've had people text me and they wanted Cadeau to come in. They were down on the whole team, but they were like, RJ's not the answer. And, and they were North Carolina fan. I'm like, well, look, man. Don't throw R.J. under the bus on this. Boy, you better uh, yeah. uh, think you're lucky stars. You've had R.J. Davis. Uh, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't have enough good things to say about him. He is, like I said, I, I when things were going good, he was there. When things were not going good, he was there. And I, I think he's just giving them – He, you talk about ability. We talk about players having a tough time playing through things. It's a tough year at North Carolina last year, and R.J. Davis never wavered. He's talented. Toughness is not an issue. So, yeah, I'm all uh, – man, I, I'm all about RJ Davis, man. I'm a fan. And he has been liberated because he doesn't have to play with Caleb. And that's not a, a knock on Caleb. It's – I think the two of them showed in three years that they just weren't super compatible back there together. And now he's been freed of that. I think Caleb's going to experience the same kind of liberation at Arizona as well. Um, and also the other thing, too, I want to point out, is I've thought about this more and more and got a little further away from that run that they made. RJ was the engine of that run. You know, Armando yeah. was the one with the double-doubles. Leaky locked down like mad. Brady hit those shots. RJ was the engine. He had a 30-point game, a 12-assist a game, and a 12-rebound game and was on the ball all the time. His defense against St. Peter's in the Elite Eight that year was the best defense he's ever played in his life, in my opinion. And I just think now that it's his, he doesn't have to worry about our Caleb being on the ball. And, man, if I get rid of the ball now to Caleb, I ain't going to get it back and no one's going to touch it. That's not a part of the equation. The, a liberated R.J. Davis, to me, is going to be a guy that shows a little bit more of everything in this game than we've seen before. Yeah, he is. And he's going to be liberated on the floor and off the floor. Yeah. Uh, yeah, without Caleb. Absolutely. And yeah. uh, 
uh, I, I just think I, I just in a way I'm contradicting myself here. I think it feels like a new start, but it's still he's in year number four, so it's a continuation. He doesn't need a new start as far as what he does. He's probably got a new start around him. And that's probably a common theme, you know, where Jalen Withers needed a new cast. Yeah. Uh, 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 Cormac Ryan needed a new cast. Harrison Ingram needed a new cast. Well, R.J. Davis and Amando Baycott needed a new cast. So, yeah, they did. Uh I think you're looking here where everybody on this team basically, you know, needed a new look, needed a new family around them. Uh, So, yeah, I I just think, uh, I I just don't think you can uh, overstate that. You see more of that pros than you do in college. You see that all the time in the NFL, you know, guys who, who just needed a fit. I, well, I'll give you an example, though, in college, being an SEC country, Bo Nix at Oregon. Yeah. And, you know, people – Michael talk, Penix from Indi- when he was at Indiana to Washington, yeah, same thing. Yeah, yeah. But I'm a, I, I follow Auburn football quite a bit. I have since I was a kid. And uh, they uh, – he was obviously talented, but, you know – and Malzahn was supposed to be a quarterback whisperer, but um, – yeah. If you look at – he's just – his coaching's maddening. You know, they could beat Alabama one game, lose to uh, Wofford the next one. And and yeah. so – and, and this, but that was the whole consistency. And now you've looked at what being – and I heard somebody say on TV, well, he's good. He's in a place with better coaching. He's got, you know, the players around him and the same mission. And I just kind of see that at North – it almost feels like – a like I said, almost like a pro team, like an NFL team or an NBA team where this yeah. guy just didn't fit here. He needed to go somewhere else. and He just needed to go, I think, go somewhere where they're wanted and where they're appreciated. We've heard that about Dan Campbell at, 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 with the Lions, with uh, uh, the quarterback that was with the Rams. You know, they're trying to get him out of there. And, and even though we went to a Super Bowl, they're trying to get him out. Campbell's like, hey, come here, man. I believe in you. And what a difference well, that makes. So to, to I, back, I just like you say, liberating is a good word. Well, to back up what you're saying is that's exactly what RJ said. One of the first things, the first time I talked to him in early October, I asked about it. I said, did you guys need all this freshness, all this new stuff, this newness? I, I said, do you need all this newness? He said, yes, we needed, we need to be fresher. It's fresh. Yeah, Armando said it was invigorating that early. And, and Kayla or RJ said again last week, he repeated something he said earlier in the month. So, you know, when they repeat it three or four weeks apart, you know, it's pretty, pretty straight up, right? He said he felt it right away. So imagine the pickup that they were playing, the way being around each other and how old it had gotten in a couple in some ways. And suddenly you got a guy like Cormac Ryan comes in there who, when he screws up in practice, he, kicks the ball into the rafters and screams. And you've got a guy like Ingram who is much better Fanny smacker than anybody realize. It has no problem fa- smacking even Armando's Fanny, right? And then you've got a guy like Withers who will dunk in your face and stare you down in practice. <laughs> I, I think it's the newness. It's the freshness. It's the vitality that these guys bring. And there's a level of passion that each of them play with, including Woj. We were talking about what he does. There's passion. I think Armando described his game as being passionate. I, I think that those are all parts that are good for Hubert. Hubert needed something fresh and new, too. He inherited a lot of the Roy guys, and he tried to make it work. They had the great run. But you know what? That's why I think year three is a year we can look at Hubert Davis and say, okay, we're going to really know if you're a good coach or not now because you've gone through the first two waves. The first one was just, for him, his head was probably spinning, and anybody's would be in that situation. And then suddenly this group that was maddening got hot and took him to a title game. And then last year he learned about, expectations himself he learned about the noise as well and how that can affect teams and you can't completely get him to turn off the noise 
you can't do that. You can't expect that they're not hearing what's being said out there. So he brings in a group now, a lot of maturity, a lot of smart guys, got some college graduates in that starting lineup. And I think a group that has more of a common we mission. That's just a sense I'm getting. I could be wrong. They could end up being an NIT team, David. I have no idea. I think they're going to be a lot better than that. And I think that there is uh, sort of what Brady wanted to get out of the UNC experience was different than what Dawson Garcia wanted. And I think there's more Brady missions here with the Ryan, with the Wojcik, with the Withers, with an Ingram, than there is a Dawson Garcia mission. Is that fair to say, do you think? Yeah, I think so. And I, I saw uh, my good friend uh, Terrence Oglesby is doing ACC review on field of 68 in North Carolina yesterday. And he said uh, at, at, at least he thinks this is a second weekend team in the NCAA tournament. And people ask me about teams and, and um, I, uh, I'll i get asked about certain teams and they'll be like, this is, don't you think this is a Final Four team? This is a national championship team. And in college basketball, I never use that. Now, I will in college football. Is Georgia a national championship yeah. team? Is Mich- Absolutely. Yeah. But there's the thing. You're talking about a 12-game regular season. And then you get – you only have four teams of a chance. You can – this year's been different, but most years you can name the four in July. Whereas in basketball, it's different, man. You you have one bad half and you're done. And uh, if you're not, if you have a poor night shooting, I don't care how good, how many, you know, you win your conference tournament. That's probably the kiss of death going into yeah. the NCAA tournament. So you know, being hot, trending the right way, it's almost like the baseball playoffs. It doesn't matter. You know, Arizona Diamondbacks win 84 games during the World Series. It's much more like baseball than it is. Win 101 yeah. and don't win a playoff game. Yeah. So, the in, so college with basketball, that. you're talking about how deep you go in March. It's more like Major League Baseball than it is college football. Yeah. You know, it's, it's who gets hot. You know, who has a bad game? Who has – who's bad? Who can make a shot down the stretch? And if you can't, you're gone. You know, there's no best of seven. There's no any of that. So, um, people ask me, that's why I say I never know. The best hope that I can give you, I think if a team, if you get to the round of 16, or maybe even say, okay, I think you may be good enough to get to an Elite Eight, then it's one game at a time. You know, and the upsets and all that, those first round games in the NCAA tournament, that's where the March Madness is at. That's where everything's crazy. And then things kind of settle down a little bit more. So if you can get through that first week, yeah. then everything kind of, all things are kind of equal. So I, I think that's about as good as a compliment you can give a team is, hey, I think you can get through first weekend. Yeah, I agree because what you're saying is, you're not saying that's the baseline, but you're kind of saying that's sort of in the middle of what we're thinking right now. And if they're a little bit better, that means you get to a third weekend and not just the second weekend. And if you fall a little bit short, maybe you make the tournament, but you go out early, you have that bad shooting night. You don't have anybody that can make up for it, which that club experienced a lot last year. They just didn't have good shooters. I do think they have more shooters now. And I agree. I think I agree with what Terrence is saying. I think, I think second weekend is fair. And there's a reason we're actually not doing a staff picks for the season this year on this team. Cause I don't think it's really kind of fair to ask no. someone to do a full pick because we don't know where all these, what all the, how these components are all going to mesh. It would just be guessing. I think they should be good. I think they should be about what Terrence said. Can they end up being better? Would it shock me if they're in the final four? No, it wouldn't shock me. Would it shock me if they're struggling to make the tournament? I would be more surprised at that than if they're playing the third weekend of the tournament. So, because it's hard to imagine this much talent, this much experience, it's much been there, done that. And, and RJ and Armando being out there, it's hard to imagine them struggling to get to the tournament again. Yeah, I, I would be, I would be surprised on that. Um, I agree. Um, you know, and I don't know. I don't, yeah, uh, you know, I don't really know what else to say. I don't know how how much more you know you could make of that, but I I I think we just look at this team and say, what is your confidence from last year? 
is this team better than going to be better than last year's team? And I think we 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 agree with that. And you think how close they were last year, another two or three games and they're in. So I, I feel yeah. like, you know, you, if you could switch a game or two. Uh, so I think it comes down to a lot of that. And and I believe, uh, I believe obviously this is a better team. But like we said, we feel like we're going to get in the tournament. And some people feel pretty confident that, you know, that they'll, they'll make a run. Final question. And I'm saving this for last. Uh, where does Elliot Cadeau fit into all this? And, and before you answer, uh, he, when I was at practice, he wasn't with the white team. It was a little bit of surprise. I, I had heard that that might be happening early, but they go down to Florida Atlantic and he wasn't a starter down there. Um, Armando and RJ were talking about him coming off the bench. Elliot has said that, look, it's two year plan. I don't have to start right now. I'm not worried about that. But one of the things I've also been told is that when he gets on the floor, he impacts right away, just makes everybody better. So, we're thinking, I'm thinking Sweet 16 without really knowing what Elliot's going to bring. If he ends up being more the Ed Coda as a freshman, more the Kendall Marshall as a freshman, how does that change this group? I thought him, I, I, I'll say this. Um, I've got a, a friend of mine who, uh, is one of the very, very top assistant coaches in the country. If, if you look, you, you'll have these, um, not necessarily polls, but you'll have articles on the top assistant coaches in the country. That he's mentioned on every one, like the top 20. And uh very good friend of mine. So I sat with him. He's the same one that told me Drake Powell, looks like a North Carolina player. You remember yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you talk about it? I, I was sitting with him that Saturday afternoon, pretty well all afternoon, caught up with him. And I said, what do you think about North Carolina next year? And he said, right now it's not an NCAA tournament team. Now, this was before they made a couple more additions, but one thing he was looking at was he didn't think the roster was as athletic. Well, when, when Elliot – Trent, uh, reclassed. I asked him about it. He said, well, it changes things. And I've told you this. He is the best. He has the quickest hands I've ever seen on a high school player. Some of the best vision I've ever seen. The best open floor passer I've seen. Full court passer I've seen. He speeds the team up just with his presence because he just – he passes people open. He gets people in the open spots. You run the floor, he can deliver a 60-foot – Matt Magic Johnson used to do a 60-foot no look on the dime. You know, just – only God can – I've made that statement. Only God can coach that. Yeah. yeah. So he'd, he'd look away and the ball would get there. It's so he's, he's phenomenal. Um, I think – I asked him, I said, okay, how does this change? He said, all the difference in the world because he makes them quicker – he makes them more athletic. Um, he's going to be on the floor. So don't look at this and they say, well, we're, what, what are we doing? We'll have to wait a year on Elliot too. He's going to be a huge, huge, huge part of this. Yeah. I like guys coming in maybe as a sixth man who bring energy. Uh, and that's normally a role they do. And I look at him and he does that. And I, I think, too, we've had – you and I are not in total agreement, maybe, of why he doesn't start. You know, you, we were discussing it before we came on. Maybe certain things. We have, you know, certain reasons that we we think maybe why it's not. I'm more. It's but, for me. I'm more trying to explain the rationale behind it. I'm not 100 percent sure because I I haven't seen him play enough. I understand why Hubert's doing it, but and we could get into it right here if you want. I understand why Hubert might be doing it. And 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 I actually have a drop running Friday where I ask where I, I address this myself. People can can listen to that when it falls. So I'll briefly say what I say in the drop, and you can address it there. But I, I, it, part of it might be diffusing some of the pressure. Part of it might be because he just turned eighteen. He's got a bunch of old men around him, and they want him to slowly immerse himself and ingratiate himself in there. And the other thing might just be it's something that's probably going to happen eventually. There's no need to rush it right now. Because what if he gets off to a tough start? That's kind of tough to climb out of for a kid playing with older guys. That's 
what I think Hubert. Hubert won't really talk about it. He doesn't really go there when he's asked about Elliot. So I'm just assuming based on all my years of doing this, and I guess I figured the best comparison is it, K- Kendall Marshall about six, seven weeks, close to the middle of the season. And even with Ty Lawson, Bobby Frazier started the first six games that year, and then Lawson ended up taking over and starting. So that could end up happening. Yeah, and I see that point. And I've told you, I feel like that, uh, you know, Hubert has, has, has promised that starting point guard job to RJ. Yeah. Well, we did that in the past. And is that bad? No, it's not. Because I've, I've gone on public record in front of the whole world telling you what I think about it. But Elliot is too. And, and now, let me say this. In today's game, and even some of the top, college programs have multiple ball handlers and they don't call themselves point guards. They call themselves on ball guards. You're either on ball or off ball. Yeah. I'll give you an example. I thought Caleb was on the ball way too much last year because an on ball is not necessarily a guy that brings the ball down the floor and sets offense. We all know what happens when you have 10 seconds left to go on the shot clock, you either go into isolation, the ball's out front, you either go into isolation or you put somebody in the ball screen. Caleb Love found himself more times than not with a ball in his hands with under 10 seconds left in the ball screen coming. That's an on ball guard to me. And it didn't work out well a lot. No. I can see it where both these guys are in a situation where the ball is you know, late, either or. Elliot could bring it down. RJ has the ball in his hands late. RJ could bring it down. Elliot has the ball in his hands late. But some of these other guys do. You're talking about some of these other perimeter players. We're talking about Logic in there a lot. We're talking about Cormac Ryan in there a lot. We're talking about Harrison Ingram in there a lot. Well, there's only so many guys you can play. And then you've got uh, Withers at the four. You've got Baycott. You've got Jalen Washington. You're very deep. So how off, you know, so you've got all these different lineups and all these rosters and all these mixes. But in the end, I think that if you look at the best teams right now in college basketball, not just this year, but in the past few years, they have had multiple on-ball guards that can score, but most importantly, can play make. Okay? So I think eventually – Elliot and RJ, you know, Hubert can keep that promise and they can mesh and play together. I think it's in North Carolina's best interest that that happens, and I think it will. I'm going to throw one more thing at you, and I'll just tell everybody. I, I said we were going to hit on Baycott, but we actually hit on Armando intermittently throughout, so we don't really, really need to isolate him here in this. Um, if they're in a shot clock situation, go watch Stanford film last year. Harrison Ingram on the ball all the time. Watch Notre Dame, Cormac Ryan on the ball all the time. Brown, Wojcik was on the ball a lot in shot clock situations, especially later in the year. RJ, and then eventually Elliott will have that college experience doing that. If you're an opponent and you've got a team that has five dudes, they're all not going to be on the floor at the same time, but four of them could be, that have been on the ball a lot in shot clock situations, how does that stress the opposing team? I think – I don't mean this badly, but if the team's got R.J. and Elliott and, and they want to put Harrison Ingram on the ball, I hope they do that. Well, okay, what I'm saying is in the course of the game, it, depending on what kind of stuff they're running, if you find it – last year there were times all of a sudden Pete had it and there were four seconds left in the shot clock and he's 24 feet from the basket. If you if you substitute that with Ingram, at least Ingram could find somebody there, right? So what I'm saying is, you could run a lot of stuff and not be as predictable. And if you're, and I also think this means you don't have to run as many sets. I just think it's hard offensively. It's hard in high school offensively if you have guys the defense doesn't respect. They call it dorking a player. <laughs> well, what's that mean? You don't guard them. North Carolina had a bunch of guys get dork last year. And so it just having guys like like you say, if if all five guys on the floor can get theirs, 
and create for others, yes, a ton of stress on it, opposition. That's how some of these teams have won. You know, Gonzaga's had these teams have been able to do that the last yeah. few years. Yeah. And, and you know, Baylor could do it the year they won the national chip. Kansas could do it the Kansas. year they won. Yeah, two team. years ago, Kansas had a lot of guys like that. Yeah. So, you know, um, UConn. UConn got to where they were last year in March and April, winning the national championship. By the time they they just peaked at the right time, but the players peaked individually. And uh, you look at that UConn lineup, that roster, and all of a sudden you were saying, okay, they don't have anybody on this roster that can't beat us. Everybody yeah. they've got can beat us. Everybody they've got right now is hot. And, man, that was just uh, that was just a kiss of death. You know, well, and that's my other point. And and David, that's my other point about bringing this up. It's not so much they're going to be on the ball in the shot clock. They've been on it, meaning they can handle stuff. They can create. They can uh, – you watch <laughs> – I go back to last year's team. And Leakey's in the NBA. Leakey's with the Hornets. He's on an NBA roster. He's a great defensive player. But if the ball's in his hands with yeah. seven or eight seconds left, he's looking to get the ball to a guard instead of being a guy that maybe can create from the wing. So you don't have to, I'm not saying you have to traditionally get someone at the top and then they run something. You can run a lot of stuff from a variety of different places. So you're less, you're, you're less predictable. You're much harder to defend and you can find those guys. I, I think it's going to be interesting to see if they're a much more efficient shot clock situation. Team well, you know who they always the find in through, you know, who the ball always finds the guy that can't score. That's who the ball a million times. Coach, <laughs> I'm open and I'm about Sunders raising you. Yeah. The best line I've ever heard. <laughs> we had a player one time tell another player on another team that he was offensively challenged. Tell a player, you can't guard me. And the player on another team says, we don't have to. So that's that's usually who the open player, uh, we don't have to guard you. Shoot all you want to. So that's usually who to, who it finds. And your hope is this year that there's not anybody out there that the ball finds because they can't make a bucket, you know. It's going to be a fun team to cover because I think the storylines will be plentiful. There's going to be a lot of guys to monitor. Last year's team very quickly became tough to cover because some of the things that it needed to happen, you started sensing weren't going to happen. And I think with this group, there's so much newness that we may not really have a handle on them until sometime in mid-January. And I'm okay with that because I like variety. I like I like to see something get kind of mixed up and not 100% sure how it's going to come out on the other end. But I suspect, David, that this is going to be at the minimum a good team with the potential of being a very good team. Yeah, and, and, and I – I'm not going to go full Dabo here and say, hey, get, but maybe you need to lose some games to lighten up the bandwagon. I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say the other. I'm going to say be patient. Now, they may come out like a house of fire, but like I said, oh, it's it's a, a new roster with talent, uh, and, and I think with the way that they play, it'll come together because they want to play for each other and and – and, and get the other guy open, get other guys shot. They understand ball movement. They understand passing. It's a smart team, can shoot. I think yeah. they, they, uh, what's the word I'm trying to think of? I, I think, you know, that they really are able to help the other one with a playing style that they have. Mm -hmm. One plays off another one. Yeah. Um, if one needs to get the ball inside, well, the guy around it can shoot. If one guy can get hot and make shots, we've well, got other guys that can pass. Yeah. So, I, I I think they uh, I think it in the end hopefully it'll all work out well, but I, I I've got a lot more confidence I think uh, I'll have a lot more confidence in this because I lost confidence in the team last year early 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 yeah you know yeah. two or three games in I'm like finish second yeah. work and and yeah. I, I think uh, the, you knew there was really no hope for it changing there was there was no time last year like you said okay this thing's getting ready to flip. So, yeah. and, and I think this year, like I said, I, I think they'll, 
I, I think they'll continue to get better. Yeah, some of us were talking the other day, five minutes into the first exhibition game, when we saw that Pete Nance wasn't as described, that was when we realized it's like if you don't have a quarterback, you're not going to be able to acquire one during the year in college. I'll make a deal with you. If you don't go all Dabo on me, I won't go all Tyler and Greenville on you. You want to say that again? Tyler and Greenville. Oh, okay. He's 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 the kid that called the show that, that got Dabo all fired yeah. up the other Did night. you see – did you see the next day when Dabo came in for the press conference and it, it was a Halloween day and he said, uh, he said, uh, who are you guys, who are you guys dressing up like for Halloween? One of the reporters said Tyler from Greenville. <laughs> you can say that with Dabo. He's probably cool with it. I'm glad. I, look, I don't want to go all Dabo here either, but I, I support what Dabo said a hundred percent. I thought that was great. Yeah. That, how many coaches would sit there and take that, you know? So, uh, coaches have been getting testier. Matt got a little testy on Monday, too. Well, he referred to fans that didn't show up when we won two games, but they're bitching about us only winning six right now. He used that word. I thought that was great. I, look, I'm all for coaches expressing themselves. I've told a bunch of my colleagues recently that I'm all for coaches coming after us. If they don't like something we write, I have a problem. I don't have a problem with Dave Dorn did with Steve Smith. I'm all for it. Do it. And I'm, and I'm, I'm all for, and I'm all for coaches still in signs. I'm all for, well, just do it the right way. Do it during the course of the game. Not that way though. You're not working hard enough. You know what I call coaches don't steal signs. Lazy. What, it, what is uh who is it? That's, you know, this, this was probably an sec coach. said, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. Yeah. Hey, we had a kid one time in the district tournament high school. I call a play. I'm coaching, was coaching girls basketball. And she goes, I call a play on the side out. And she goes, let's say I call North Carolina. And she goes, North Carolina. And the girl was Gardner. Said, yeah, yeah, you know, North Carolina, you go down to, you're going to go down to the uh, other block and spring this girl up. And I'm going to switch. And then you do this. So she walked our player through the play right before we got the ball thrown in. That was nice of her. That's, that a, said team that. That, that's a team that is well coached. Yeah. Well, like North Carolina, when Weber called the timeout, everybody on the Carolina bench knew they didn't have any, and a bunch of guys in Michigan are doing this. Who was it that said, if you're not cheating, you're not trying? It was got to be an SEC football coach. <laughs> I don't, I've heard it. I don't remember who it was. Uh, anyway, well. Well, I know. Well, they, oh, no, I knew who it was. It was uh, Tony Sergus. Was it Sergus? Sergus Sir, just died, Goose. didn't he? Yeah, it's Did Goose. he just die? You're not wow. cheating. Yeah, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. Yeah. Did he say that on the Hard Knock show or something, or was it? No, nah, no, nah, but that 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 was who that was who said it. Yeah. Wow, interesting. Because I, I remember that was, the time. I figured that was coined somewhere in Auburn, you Alabama, remember, or Ravens, Athens, Georgia. The Ravens, in my opinion, probably cost the Titans at least one Super Bowl, and I'm a Titan living in Tennessee. So, uh, and I, I I remember him saying that because you know he fell on the big thing was he was always trying to hurt quarterbacks. He fell on McNair. They would have fined him $100,000 now. He fell on McNair, like, went with him about 10 yards and then fell on him. He weighed 400 pounds and put him out for, you know, put him out for the playoffs. So that was back in the bounty days. That's probably yeah. where that came out of. That was the bounty yeah. days. Yeah. Wow. All right. Well, we, we Jacob and I went off the rails a bunch this week. We don't need to go off the rails anymore. We've already been doing this. This might be the longest podcast of all time, but it's previewing. The brand new look, North Carolina Tar Heels. David, I'm excited. I've got the football basketball overlap now. Monday night at the Dean Dome, Carolina plays Radford. Tar Heels play again the following Sunday, the day after the Duke football game. So they're in it. They're going to jump into it hard, hit the Bahamas here in a few weeks. And I think we're going to learn something when they're in the Bahamas. For David Sisk. I'm AJ. Thank you to Underdog Fantasy for always sponsoring us. If you like this video, if you're excited about the Tar Heels starting basketball season, click like, make sure you subscribe to our channel, hit that notification bell so you get updates every time we upload, which is often, and tell your Tar Heel friends that we're here, not just here on YouTube, but go to our channel, or go to our, our site, rather, tarheelillustrated.com, just $8.33 a month for a one-year subscription, and you can be the biggest Carolina insider at work or on your block or at your bar or at your little league field, wherever it is, you'll be a know-it-all. He's David. I'm AJ. Thanks for stopping by.